welcome everyone to our next session on cartography. Yeah, I'm very, very honored to introduce two speakers here to you today. We got David Garcia, I think better known as Mapmaker to most of you. He's yeah, passionate about hot uh, OSM and OSGeo, and uh, yeah, we're very passionate about creating maps as well. And he also now started researching maps also for, um, and the use of crowdsourced geographic information for New Zealand specifically, as he also started his PhD at the University of Canterbury last year as well. And he's presenting today with Martin Dittus, I think also well known to our community. He did a lot of amazing research about HOT and the Missing Maps community, told us a lot about ourselves, enabled us to learn a little bit more about ourselves, how we what is motivating us, how we are interacting, and what kind of impact it has. And he now works for the Oxford Internet Institute, where he's looking at Wikimedia and the Wikimedia community and Wikimedia data, and most importantly, how the knowledge that is shared in Wikipedia is controlled into has actually access to the knowledge that is presented in Wikimedia. And he's now also taking this conversation further to the OSM community. Yeah, I'm very looking forward to hearing more about this. We got 45 minutes for the presentations, 40 to 45 minutes, and then 10 minutes for the discussion afterwards as well. Give the floor to you. Thank you very much, Melanie. Uh, good morning, everybody. I hope you're well. I hope you slept well. Um, David and I met a few years ago at a mapathon. And uh, I, I saw him present there, and I was immediately fascinated by his cartography and by his way of telling stories about the cartography. So we, we, we kind of started chatting, and then we started following each other on social media. And we now live on, on separate continents, but we, through uh, uh, these, these kinds of uh, in, mutual interests that we share, we, we kind of kept in touch. And then earlier in the year, we thought, um, because we have a kind of complementary perspectives on OpenStreetMap and on mapping, as a practice and on online community and uh, global communities and so on, we thought maybe we should try and uh, turn that into a talk together and, and, and kind of tell, tell you about some of the stories uh, that we've encountered and we've been, we've been experiencing. Uh, so the, the story that we're going to talk about today, or the, the talk that we're giving you today, when one way of, of describing it could be, uh, we, these are our thoughts about the present and about the future of uh, OpenStreetMap. Uh, hello, I'm David. I'm, I make maps and I'm now a student and I love OpenStreetMap. I love tracing coral reefs. And this, this also came out, this conversation is also about something like, there's something that we say about what we do. We're, doing, we're gonna do this as OpenStreetMap. And this is what we actually do. And this is what happens. And I, that's my interest. I, I really look for those situations where the technology is on its limit, or there are surprising ways of using it. Uh, and as a Filipino living in New Zealand, I've been through disaster or war, uh, and now I'm interested in indigenous issues because I'm kind of in exile <laughs> there, and I have to stay there for a while because it's not safe in the country. So I thought, okay, how do I tell this story? Because I love OSM, and uh, it's a very, my life is very meaningful because of, of OpenStreetMap. And I think now that I'm a researcher, how, how can I still contribute to OpenStreetMap and can kind of be happy and finish the PhD? And then we talk, and then now we're here. So thanks for coming. So, as Melanie said, my name is Martin. Uh, the, these days, I, I call myself an accidental academic. I started out as a software developer and uh, in, in startups and so on. And then uh, through a few detours, ended up uh, being, uh, um, being an academic. Um, my, my current job title is digital geographer. Um, as, as part of my research in the last few years, I spent a lot of time with hot and mis with uh, missing maps. And one of the questions uh, uh, in, in, in the research that we did together was how do we grow the community? So I want to start with, uh, with, with that, I've, I've presented on, on, the, on, the, on the findings at, at past at previous hot summits and, and state of the maps, uh, so I don't want necessarily go into all the details, but I want to give you a high level uh, uh, perspective as, as a starting point and into our talk. So the question back then really was, um, we, we are reali realizing that there, there are many places in the world that are unmapped, so we need as many participants in the, in the practice of, of mapping the world as we can uh, get. Um, but we didn't at the time really understand what it was that drove the enthusiasm of, of mappers or what it was that uh, allowed us to build these 
uh, these large uh, volunteer communities. So in, in that research, we spent, looked at a lot of factors that might inform someone's decisions to, to participate and then to stick around. So we looked at uh, the task design in the, in the tasking manager. We looked at mapathons as a setting, um, as, as both in terms of the coordination practice, but also in terms of the social experience. We looked at validator feedback, the importance of receiving uh, uh, feedback once you've contributed. Again, I won't necessarily give you all the details, but I want to give you kind of two broad uh, conclusions that I personally um, got out of that research. The first is about this question of recruiting. Where do you find those, or, or how, do you, how, do you, how do you make these mappers? So initially I thought my mental model in the beginning was how do we convert someone into a really good mapper so that they, they enjoy the practice and they stick around and they, and they contribute well and a lot and all these kind of things. And over time I realized, well, maybe that's part of the question, but maybe also not everybody is going to be interested in mapping. And, and I think mapathons and, and uh, volunteering as a, as a map model for, uh, for mapping, as, as a kind of context for mapping, as opposed to you mapping your neighborhood, volunteering for a social cause, really illustrated that to me because through HOT, through Missing Maps and, and organizations like that, um, a lot, of, a lot more people got exposed to the mapping practice. And largely what we found, many people who start doing that don't necessarily stick around. Even though they might maybe appreciate the initial experience, uh, I, I think uh, in the end this question of what would make someone stay is, 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 is really also a question about the person. It's really a question about what, is, uh, what are they interested in, what do they, what, uh, what do they get enjoyment out of. Also, do they find a social setting in which they're, uh, they're comfortable? So broadly speaking, for me that now means maybe it's not really a question of converting someone into a mapper, but maybe it's a question of giving everybody an opportunity. And, and when that happens, to give them the support, but also accepting that not everybody is going to, uh, to keep doing that. And so one of the things we learned through the mapathons is one of the key ways of, of, of doing that is to have regular mapping activities that are public, that are open, that are announced in advance, so maybe that people know, oh, on the, every first Wednesday of the month I can go there, these kind of things. And we, we saw that really drove, uh, in, in London and in other places, that really drove growth in the community. The, the other really important uh, lesson we learned is about feedback. It's also something that came as a, a, as a bit of a surprise to me, that um, we looked at, as one of the studies, uh, we, we looked at uh, validator feedback. What happens when people contribute for the first time through the tasking manager, maybe at a mapathon, maybe at home, and then a validator looks at their work and then sends them a message and then valid, uh, uh, marks the task as, as uh, validated or uh, um, kind of sends it back to, for, for corrections. And we largely found, to my surprise, that it doesn't seem to be that bad to be told that you, did, you, you made some mistakes there. So uh, on, on many other online communities, in Wikipedia, Stack Overflow, and many other places where people get rated for their contributions, a negative rating can be really detrimental to motivations because it feels like a public shaming. Validator feedback is private. So you don't feel shamed when, when a validator tells you, uh, here is how you can do better next time. I think it is important that how the validator communicates that, what, what kind of uh, uh, type of message they send. Another thing we found is that uh, something that is incredibly powerful for the motivation or the decision to stick around is to say, simply say thanks, or to, uh, to simply be appreciative of the contribution. For many people who contributed online, maybe the validator feedback is the first time they have a social encounter with another person in an open street map context. So it, it, suddenly it becomes really important what that person tells you. And I think for many people it's incredibly meaningful to then be told, thank you, your contribution is, is, uh, is meaningful to us and, and you helped us advance this further. So rather, rather than thinking of it in, in terms of a kind of a rating system or, uh, or, or um, uh, uh, yeah, as, as it is on many other platforms. Here, I think it's closer to a mentoring system, and I think that's quite important, uh, interesting. So, many, many more details. I, I, I put, uh, last week, I, I published uh, in my OpenStreetMap diary, I published a, a summary of the research. You can go there, the links to the papers, um, and so on. Um, now, I'm a digital geographer at the Oxford Internet Institute. I work with this guy here, Mark Graham. He's a geographer. Uh, um, he, he's done uh, loads of interesting research in the past, and he's, he's an information geographer. So with, with him, I do information geography. So where geography maybe might ask, 
Is there a castle in this place? Is there a mountain in this place? Information geography asks, is this castle on OpenStreetMap? Is this mountain on OpenStreetMap? So a few years ago, Mark and his colleagues made this map, which many of you might, might have seen already. Uh, this is the content density on OpenStreetMap. If we take all the nodes, I believe, uh, uh, in, uh, that are on OpenStreetMap on a map of the world and we draw that as a, as a heat map, then we find that, well, OpenStreetMap at the time, I think it was 2014, so maybe now looks quite different, but back in 2014, OpenStreetMap was kind of mapping the world, but really there's a lot of emphasis on, on uh, Europe and uh, North America, Japan, uh, um, and, and some other corners of the world, but large places in the world were not on map. In my current work, I also look at Wikipedia, and with Wikipedia, you see a very similar kind of uh, distribution. This, again, this is an old map, this is from 2011, Current Wikipedia looks much better, um, but there you also see this the similar kind of emphasis on Europe, on North America, and uh, certain, uh, certain countries in, in um, East and uh, South Asia, and so on, Australia, but many other parts of the world that were, at the time were not really represented on Wikipedia. So in my current work, partially I'm trying to understand why is that? Why do we see these, these kinds of imbalances of representation? The fact that certain parts of the world are represented on these platforms and others aren't. And there are many factors, and in, in fact, it would be a whole separate talk to, to go into all the details, but I think one of, one, one of the foundational elements that is also quite intuitive for, for us to understand, a lot of it at the time also had to do with connectivity. Can people, how easily can people go online? So this is something that is now rapidly changing because in many parts of the world, uh, connectivity is getting cheaper and more affordable with smartphones and all these kind of things. So, so this is a, a, these are now old numbers, but I think it's quite striking, a striking way to illustrate that. Again, a, a map produced by Mark and, and his uh, colleagues. This is the cost of broadband connectivity relative to the monthly average salary. And once you compare it in this way, you see that there are parts in the world where broadband costs more than the monthly average salary. I think that is quite striking. Here, we don't, I'm, I'm European, we don't think twice about having two, three types of connection. I have my cell phone, I have uh, broadband at home, my employer has broadband, uh, um, so there are many places for me to, to, to be connected, and there are many parts in the world. It's getting better rapidly in, in, in Africa and other places. India also is now much more connected than it was uh, 10 years ago, but, but still fundamentally it's the case, broad connectivity is not equal, equally distributed. And as a result, we see that not only is representation of the world unequally distributed. Not only is Africa, for example, not as well mapped as Europe. It's also who makes these representations is unequally distributed. So this here is a map of Wikipedia and is asking the question, who in the world uh, is able to create their own Wikipedia articles about their own places? So to the, this shows the extent to which uh, articles about countries in Africa have been written about people from these countries, or articles about places in Europe have been written about uh, people from these countries. We, with, we can do that easily in, open, in Wikipedia uh, because the um, IP addresses of anonymous, anonymous editors are in the public uh, edit history. With OpenStreetMap, it would be more challenging to, um, to show that. And again, here see, we, we see there are many places in the world where people don't write their own Wikipedia articles, but instead, they're being written about by others. To their big credit, the Wikipedia community is really switched on and they, they're now putting a lot of effort into, into addressing this issue. And in fact, they've recognized it as a social injustice. They see this is, that this is the result of a structural inequality, um, is an imbalance in opportunity. And they're now putting a lot of resources, a lot of time, a lot of effort into addressing this. And in fact, they made a part of their strategy for the coming years as one of the central go uh, goals for the Wikimedia Foundation and the Wikipedia community as a whole um, is, a, is a concept that they call knowledge equity, which is essentially the, uh, the value that they now hold high to say that um, the people who are being written about on Wikipedia should be participating in those representations. They should be, making, be able to make decisions about how their communities, how their places are being represented on Wikipedia. Um, so this, an open street map, from the beginning we had uh, uh, this question of, of local knowledge, which is part of that. Uh, but I think the next step from there, what, what, what the, the notion of local knowledge does not quite already articulate, is also the question that at the moment not everybody has an equal opportunity to participate. So I think from an OpenStreetMap perspective, this is an interesting uh, step to take. 
And as a result, Wikipedia is a very active, a very globally active community, like the OpenStreetMap community. So there are hundreds of initiatives, of initiatives to address systemic biases. One of the challenges uh, um, is that there are many unexpected barriers to participation. So I, I mentioned one is connectivity. Uh, another one is the fact that um, the, uh, the, the, the capacity to participate, to make time available to participate is not equally distributed. Last year I was at Wikimania in Cape Town, which is the global gathering of the Wikipedia community, where in a Q&A session an African editor stood up and said, so hold on, you're, you're asking us to contribute our knowledge for free. Um, people here can't afford to donate their time. So she was, was a long, uh, she was a very active Wikimedian and Wikipedian, so she, she was not, it was a bit of a rhetorical provocation in that, in that uh, moment, but uh, I thought it was a very nice way of illustrating a, 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 an additional barrier of participation. If you're interested in that, there's an article that, uh, that Mark and me put on Wired where we tell that story with a bit more, more detail. But largely speaking, the, um, the, the, the summary is uh, this capacity to volunteer, to donate our time to OpenStreetMap, to Wikipedia, is not globally universal. And in fact, it's, uh, if, if we look at it from a global perspective, it's kind of an exception. Which also means that I've been looking at uh, hot and, and uh, missing maps from a European perspective, from a North American perspective with mapathons and volunteering settings and so on. Most likely my research does not translate to many places in the world. This also means that community mapping, which is the thing that we are doing, also most likely because of that looks quite different in different places in the world. And it also means that one of the, one of the surprising powers of OpenStreetMap and of HOT and organizations like them is they're in fact, they are part of a global uh, volunteer force and a part of a global communi community uh, and part of an open source community and all these things. But I think that, uh, very importantly, we also have to recognize they're part of a global employment network. And it is just as important as, as all the other parts because this is one of the ways in which many parts of the world can participate in the creation of maps that otherwise could not. So all of these are, are kind of steps or, or, or kind of uh, perspectives on trying to understand what are the limitations of this model of contributing to OpenStreetMap. Um, what, what are things that uh, may, maybe look the same around the world, may, maybe uh, aren't there? There are other questions we could look at. So uh, a long running question in the OpenStreetMap community, particularly in the hot community, what do we do about vulnerable communities? Sometimes being mapped also exposes you to, to risk um, how do we deal with sacred knowledge? There are communities in the world who don't want certain knowledge to be made public. There's, there's a language barrier. Um, I was uh, talking to Naveen from uh, uh, OpenStreetMap India the other day, and he, he had this uh, very nice example of, of the language barrier. This OpenStreetMap, the, the main uh, site about India, is, uh, everything is labeled in English. English is spoken in India, but only 20 to 30 percent of the country speak it. There, depending on how you count, there are 20 official languages in India, about 70 are spoken in India. Um, so they would, one language for one country would not make sense in that, in that situation. So as a response, OpenStreetMap India is now experimenting with ve vector tiles, which allows, so one of the issues with, with uh, language selection on OpenStreetMap is it requires terabytes of uh, space to, uh, to store all the tiles. And if you were to offer multiple language versions based on the raster, um, it, would, it would be become incredibly expensive. But vector tiles, one of the surprising uh, side effects of offering vector tiles as a way of displaying the map is it allows dynamic uh, kind of uh, uh, adjustments uh, like localization. So OpenStreetMap India is now experimenting with vector tiles where, uh, and a selector, a language selector. They don't, it's, 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 they have a first set of languages and I imagine they're, they're just going to expand that. Um, in order to address the language barrier, so uh, uh, let's say uh, the idea editor was an impor incredibly important technology to make it easy for newcomers to contribute to OpenStreetMap. I think vector tiles, maybe so surprisingly, will be an in incredibly important technology for the world to be able to consume the map in their language appropriately for their context. Um, so for me as a technologist, the, my journey over the last 10 years was, has been a kind of a process of unlearning, of realizing me as a European, as a, as, a, as a computer scientist and so on. I have a particular perspective, but there are many things in the world that I don't actually see. 
And yet I'm, as a software developer, I'm being asked to write software for the world. So the journey for me over the last 10 years was to slowly realize, well, really, I can't. Because the assumption that we're usually making as technologists that we, we build one technology, one software, one platform, one mapping process, one editor for all of the world, something that is universal, is maybe actually not that useful. And maybe there's, there's a kind of post-colonial uh, term, which I think is very useful in, in this context. Maybe what we should actually be striving for is something that is pluriversal, because it is not one world that looks the same everywhere. It's actually, in fact, many worlds, many circumstances, many capacities, many different needs, they all coexist at the same time. So the fascinating thing about uh, OpenStreetMap for me as a, as a phenomenon, as a movement, as a, as a community, as, as a set of technologies and so on is that we are quite mature now after, after 15 years and we've, we've come really far, but yet we're still regularly finding us, ourselves in situations where we, we are running out of uh, understanding of how to do this well. I think um, um, the, the general aspiration of OpenStreetMap, which I would uh, articulate as, as, as a map for the world built on local knowledge, um, driven by a global community, I think that is, that is, a, very, uh, there, there is a very nice vision. Um, and uh, I think uh, um, what, what I wanted to express, and, and I think uh, uh, what, what I'm also getting from, from, uh, uh, from the conversations I've been having over the last few months, we are, we are still, it still brings us back to these questions. How do we do this well? Okay, that's it for me. I'm going to hand over to David, and then uh, uh, in the end we'll come together again. Thanks, Martin. Oh, I'm so nervous. Okay, uh, hello everyone. I'd like, first of all, I'd like to ask who's an indigenous person in the room? I also think that's a problem and maybe we can work on that. Uh, another, I'd like to thank everyone who, who's the reason why I'm here. It took a long way for me to participate in my first state of the map. You wouldn't believe me how, how I got here. So I think my friends, co-workers, uh, people of Aotearoa, New Zealand who funded my scholarship, my mom, she paid for the ticket, so this is for you, mom. I participate in OSM and my life gains meaning because of OSM. Right now, I'm a PhD student. I'm writing a story, it's a personal one, and this is the title, How to Map an Island in the Pacific. I make nice maps. Uh, this is kind of my daily therapy, and these are the samples. This is where I live on the left. It's Aotearoa, also known as New Zealand, but this is where I came from. It's Philippines, 7,641 islands. It's a uh, it's a beautiful and deadly place at the same time. There's a popular saying in our place, especially in the Pacific cultures. If you want to know where you're going, then you should know where you came from. And this is our story. Uh, the story of the Pacific peoples. They, they migrated from Southeast Asia before the others did to the rest of Oceania. And we, we settled the ocean well before the Europeans did. And this is a forgotten story that you should know that we were there first and our knowledge was erased. Including this knowledge, this is a map. It doesn't have boundaries. The shells represent the islands and the sticks represent the ocean swells, the relationships between the islands. And our ancestors used this before every voyage and felt the waves and used the stars. And it's a different worldview. Uh, it's not a polygon. It's not a vector tile and it's embodied. This is also where I came from. When the volcano exploded in our town in 1991, the volcano's name is Pinatubo, uh, life was very difficult. At the same day, there was a typhoon, so we were very lucky. <laughs> the largest eruption of the past three decades and a typhoon at the same time. Our towns were buried, and life, well, life was kind of difficult. And then I went to college, where I lived in a slum for about seven years, and I learned mapping there because we were addressing disasters like this one. This happened today, 10 years ago. It's called Typhoon Ondoy. And I don't see the slides here, but uh, this, is, this is also part of my OSM journey because this is how I learned how to make maps. We were making maps with indigenous peoples in the upland and trying to understand the floods. And then this typhoon. In 2013, uh, Typhoon Haiyan was the strongest cyclone to make landfall in global history by then, and this is how it looked like. Uh, this is in Tacloban. Incidentally, it's, it was the same place where Fernando de Magal Magalhães or Ferdinand de Magalhães, when they were circumnavigating the world, they arrived in the Philippines here. So it's a globally important, historically important place. Uh, the sad part is a lot, thousands of, of people died. 
So one week before the typhoon, there was a group of OpenStreetMap volunteers, and they said, hey, David, there's a typhoon coming. It's a week from now. We know where the path is. We need to make maps. And there's this thing called the Mapathon, and we need to do this so the responders can, can, can do their job. And I was, I was a junior instructor in a GIS laboratory in the university. Okay, well, how do I do this? Well, okay, this is the door. Use, use the computers. And everyone was, was doing this for, for a couple of months. And if you helped us and you were part of this, I'd like to thank you very much. This is the result, the before and after in Tacloban. And this was very useful because uh, we had to understand the places where the recovery was going to happen. I, and I eventually left the university and became a humanitarian worker. For example, this is the, the destroyed beach, and that's where the soil was. And the winds were so strong that that piece of food wasn't there before the typhoon. So it, back then, it's either you're killed by the waves or killed by the strong winds. Uh, pick your choice. <laughs> Choose between the two. I'll focus on this island, and I love it very much. It's called Victory Island. Even after the disaster, the government was evicting them for, for some weird reason. Uh, but it's a very beautiful place in the middle of a reef. And I just finished tracing the reef recently. It's very wonderful. This is how it looks like in OpenStreetMap. But the sad part is that in government maps, it's just a coral. So OpenStreetMap was very instrumental in, in addressing that spatial injustice. There are 700 people there. They lost their relatives. The bodies were never found. And they're not even on the map. So we use OpenStreetMap to map with the communities and not for the communities. And we found out that in the process of the participatory mapping that they've been living there for 30 years. And they've been reclaiming the island with, with trash. And it looks like this. And for me, OpenStreetMap was a way for us to help understand their situation. So OK, we made maps with them. And because there's no internet, no, no smartphone there, uh, no, no internet access, no a lack of electricity, we made paper maps and laminated them and put them in tarpaulin because there's a lot of rain and it's a high entropy environment. And talked about evacuation, recovery, etc. For about a year. We stayed there for, for, for quite some time. I even became a judge of a local beauty pageant in the process. And then the year, the, in the year after, there's another typhoon. It came to the same area, and gladly no one, no one died, because people understood the maps. They were part of the making of the map. We were not just making maps for them, but with them. And I think maybe that made all the difference. So the missing maps. And then, the, because the job contracts with an international, a named international agency were very short, I had to get a scholarship. Uh, the contracts were just three months short. And then I got a scholarship to UCL, and I met Missing Maps, and that's where OpenStreetMap happened. Spent the year there, tried to educate myself once more, because the year after, I went back to the Philippines. And I went to, to a city called Marawi with, with a group, with a team, because ISIS and the government were, were fighting months before, and we were tracing buildings, things to us in the Philippines and others, so that recovery and reconstruction can, can be, we can help in that. Uh, this is a photo I took inside the, the war zone, and it's a very, very important experience for me. So again, with, with an urban planner hat and a GIS person hat, I tried to, but uh, we tried to facilitate something. This is also part of the story because there are moments during that exercise when I, as a specialist, wanted to do the same thing that we did in the typhoon moment. Okay, let's finish the map. Let's make the GIS files very, very clean good projection, the topologies clip and, 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 and fit, and the cadastral files are clean. But then the participants told me, well, and some of them were almost crying during the activity. They said, well, David, if you talk about this, you know, our clan members are fighting and they, there are disputes over the land. If you push this too far, I don't think we will produce peace. So at that moment, I thought, well, am I map making or, or peace making? And, Maybe there are moments when the right thing to do is to not make a map and to just listen. And then we were also doing this at the same time. This is kind of related. We were mapping human rights violations under the current government. Uh, but it became very dangerous and surveillance and all of that weird stuff. So I went to New Zealand to start a PhD where kind of, okay, this is a safe space. And then I've been thinking, okay, what am I going to do now? I, I, I still remember this phrase, it's very important for me. If you want to know where you're going, you should remember where you came from. So I tried to go back 
to the basic OSM uh, activities, try to trace reefs. That's heart-shaped reef. That's very nice. Kind of, it's fun during lunch. I also make one map every day using, using OpenStreetMap data and Blender, and, and use the, the polygons there, uh, copyright OpenStreetMap contributors. <laughs> And also participate in, in HUT, uh, especially every Friday during the activations, because I'd like to give back because you helped us in the Philippines, and I, I really feel the need that I should, I should give back. I'm becoming part of this community too, and we're inviting you to Wellington in, in November for our Oceania conference, because it's going to be fun. It's the second one. And now, and now we're here. Now, now I'm here in front of you. Um, I like this image, the, the monkey with the mirror, because there's something written in, our, in the website, and it's very important too. In its hand, it holds a mirror to remind anyone crossing the bridge to look back from where they came from and remember, remember who they are. There's a popular saying in the Pacific, if you want to know where you're going, then you should know where you came from. Because I'm kind of lost right now. I went back to the Philippines last August or July. I went back to the typhoon zone and the war zone, and I tried to remember, OK, David, why, why were you doing this? Why are you mapping? And you know, it's very existential. And I've also been trying to study Pacific cultures. I went to Oxford last July, and by accident, there's a display. This was on display. Our, the charts, the ocean charts of our Pacific ancestors. The sad part is these, these uh, treasures are not in the hands of Pacific peoples. Most of them are here in, in Germany. And maybe the sad part is beside this uh, image, there's a curation, there's, there's a description. It says, it reads something like this. This was in Oxford last July, and I found it by accident. It said, the Pacific navigation traditions declined in response to the European colonization of the Pacific. I said, okay, maybe that's an honest telling. But then, well, yeah, it's not just in response to, but because of, because we lost land, we lost labor, we lost our lives. We even lost the knowledge, and now we, we can even write the stories. There's this kind of, triggered another thought process. So what now? Again, what does it mean for us in the Pacific? And uh, I've been thinking, well, is OpenStreetMap going to be another story of an outsider discovering us? Discovering. If you look at OSM, we've been trying to avoid that, to be very, very honest, and I'm very thankful for this movement. Uh, on the left is a, is a painting in, Ham in, in Frankfurt. It's nearby. It's called The Geographer by Johannes Vermeer. It's a very beautiful one. Uh, it's a, it's, but it's a classic image of this, you know, distance, rational, map maker, geographer, drawing other places, trying to dis explore, discover the world. But he doesn't really understand the lives of the people he's mapping. And he's a he, and we should be thankful, and he's the hero. So I thought, well, what does this mean for us? And then this, this image, uh, where in Marawi, where I work. Uh, where are they? Uh, are we going to leave this model on the left and go to the right and have a more diverse community? Because I think it's not just the maps that are missing, the, the map makers are missing too. And also, there are missing stories about the mapping too, and we should tell more of that. So I'm not making any universal claim here, or I don't want to fight, but I think these are things that we should ponder on, because again, uh, going from the quote earlier, I think for us, if about the point that I raised, that there's no indigenous person in this room, if the day will come that, that if you want a day, a day to come, when there'll be a, a person right here, an indigenous person, and that person loves OpenStreetMap, how can we make that happen? How can we become a good OpenStreetMap ancestor? Because other OSM volunteers were also good ancestors to me. They helped me in the London Marathons. They showed me how to do it in OpenStreetMap, doing Haiyan. I asked for help during the, in the war zone, and, and they did that. So I think we need, we need to continue doing that. And what I'm learning so far is, is, is this, that uh, in OpenStreetMap, we, each of us kind of pays attention to a different thing, more or less. Some of us pay attention to accuracy and availability. Others, okay, let's make it, make it accessible. Or no, I'm going to teach students, make them more able, the ability. And there are some of us who are focused on the ethics and the accountability, and, and it's all wonderful. And it makes, makes me reflect about these points, something like, okay, for, for us to have a better movement, maybe let's see the world from another volunteer's eyes. Maybe that, that will help a lot. 
And I really like this, this, this part, the, the third question. What if there are times, situations, or moments when the right thing to do is to not make a map and to step back and to not be the hero and to let another person take the map and, and run with it? Uh, I'm stealing a quote from, from Twitter. Twitter is a very nice way to do a literature review. It's very nice, right? You don't have to be a voice for the voiceless. Sometimes you just need to pass the mic. So I leave you with this message. Maybe it's not just about hashtag bridge the map. Maybe it's also time to, to pass the map. Thank you very much. This guy is making me cry every time he speaks. <laughs> um, so we, we, we thought, in, in addition to telling you these stories, we thought we should also try and find a way to kind of find, find some kind of essence and find, find some kinds of uh, uh, core learnings for us that we, that we want to share with you. And I think one of the things that uh, has been coming clear to, to both of us through, through this work is that um, while it's, it's a noble aim to have one map of the world, it might be a, an impossibility. And in fact, maybe we should not even try to do that, um, try to force that to happen. And in fact, maybe the question is more, how can we have multiple maps of the world uh, coexist? Um, there, there are different ways of, of thinking about it conceptually to uh, talk about it. But, uh, I, I once heard it described as a notion of vertical maps, of kind of vertical realities that can coexist. And, and the question then also is like, what feeds into this map and what makes that map exist? Uh, and, uh, and I think David articulates this really well. It's, it's also part of our responsibility of, as mappers is all to, also to recognize that sometimes it should not be me who draws that part, who, who makes that particular map. And, and sometimes uh, it should be someone who has a, a different kind of experience or an experience of that place that, that, that I don't have. Um, I think also as a social space for HOT, that, that is equally true, that sometimes it should not be me who coordinates the initiative or who organizes the event or who is the keynote speaker. And sometimes it should be someone else or some, someone who is the, 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 the board member or in any, any, of those, any of those roles. Mm. Yep, uh, I'd like to, to touch on this, points two and three. Uh, this is just very obvious because I think in the, in the GIS literature for the, for the GIS geeks out here, OpenStreetMap is called crowdsourcing, it's data collection. But the more I stay in, in the movement, this is a lot of work, this is labor, and it, it takes time and, and cost, and we need to emphasize that. It's not just crowdsourcing, this is crowd work, and that's very important. And in the connection to that, uh, we, we want to recognize the wide range of labor that goes behind the making of the map. So the mapathon happens because someone bought the pizza and the beer, someone talked to the sponsor, someone tweeted about it, and people invited young people, and they might not, there are volunteers here who, are, who don't have a high number of changes and, and the edits, but they do all of that labor just so the, the mapping could happen. So I'd like to encourage you to, to think about that uh, in our, that relationship, to, to improve our relationship with the people who might not have the time to have 1,000 buildings in, in one week, but they, they work behind the scenes to make that happen. That's for point number three. Uh, number four, too, I, I'll pass, I'll, I'll, I'll mention this now. Maybe we can also prioritize care, whatever, whatever that means. Um, me, as a neurodiverse person, sometimes my hand shakes. And it was, it was very nice because whenever there was a hot, hot activation and I can't participate, Russ or Rebecca says, well, yeah, David, take some time. How are you? That's very nice. Yeah. And my question there is, OK, who cares for the people who care? We should also ask about that. And. Uh for me, that also resonates because uh, as, as part of doing this work over the last few years, I also sometimes took on too much and more, more than I should have. And in, in the uh, final stages of my PhD, I had my first ever and hopefully only ever panic attack, uh, which was uh, a, a circumstance where I was on three deadlines uh, on, on five projects and uh, had finished some, but there seemed like a never-ending thing. And I received an email by someone who I uh, was talking about a project that I thought we had finished and they had an additional request, can we refine this and so on, which in principle is nice, but in that moment I panicked. 
and I remember staring at my screen and, and, and physically being unable to respond and I recognized uh, uh, what I was just going through and I realized what well, the only thing I need to do right now is close my laptop and, and go on a long walk. And for me that, that, was, a, that was a wake up call and made me realize that um, this, this question of care is, is, is essential. When we care about the work and when we put effort behind the work and when we are ambitious and, and, and when we um, feel the urgency maybe also sometimes of the situation, that uh, we also recognize the first loyalty that we should have is to ourselves and, and to the people around us and we should support them uh, in, in that journey and I think that's really important. I'd like to add something to that. Uh, this is a very important moment. So last March 15, the Chrysler stairs attack happened near where I live. Uh, but the miracle of the moment, I suppose, was the first folks who asked, are you okay, David, was open seat my people. <laughs> and they said, hey, are you fine? Like, few minutes after that. And for me, that's, that's, that's wonderful, huh? Mm. Okay, next. How are we for time? We have got many stories. We are, we are now pondering, yeah, we uh, we are now pondering uh, how, much, how much detail yeah. we, we can go, go into. Are we already? No, it's, it's good. It's good. We've got, um, we should close in around 12 minutes, so we've got 12 minutes for discussions now as well. Okay, let's, let's wanna... maybe very briefly touch on the last two points and then, and then we can, uh, we can uh, yep. jump to questions. So one of the things that, again, would be kind of its own talk, but we touched on it in, in, a, uh, in a number of different ways is, uh, I think one, th one of the things that for OpenStreetMap and, and for HOT and, and organizations like them could be really useful is to find ways of codifying our understanding of our responsibilities as mappers. What I noticed in some of the projects I was involved in outside of OpenStreetMap, that, but that had to do with geodata and so on, is, is that sometimes you will be given professional opportunities to do work where you're not entirely sure how to assess, can I do this responsibly? And I was in one of those circumstances and I realized my professional training had not prepared me to answer really that question. And, and thankfully, I was surrounded by people who I could see uh, get guidance from. And in the end, in this particular circumstance, I ended up declining the job. But I, I, it made me really recognize, at the moment, we, often we don't know how to assess should we be doing this. So I think OpenStreetMap and HOT and organizations like them, they should have a professional code, like a, 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 a code of, of mapper ethics or whatever you might want to call it, a basic set of principles that allow us to, uh, as, as, as practitioners, as mappers, to assess um, um, how, how we can be responsible in our activity. Mm. I'll mention the last one briefly. Uh, so when I was raising indigenous uh, issues, concerns, I thought, well, are you going to lead the project, David, or are you going to be the person? I thought, nah, this is not me. I am not an indigenous person. I am a Filipino national, a colonized Filipino national, but I'm not an indigenous person. I'm trying hard to be an ally, uh, thanks to our, our Maori relatives in the Pacific, but I'm not an indigenous person. And this is why I put that last point here. I dream of a day when there's someone on the board who's an indigenous person. Because that's very important. Someone who embodies the experience or really understands what it's like to do, for you to lose your land because someone drew a map. That's very important for us. Because now I was thinking in 2050, we're going to look back as the Open Sigma family. We thought we were the good guys. What's going to happen? So imagine that moment. Uh, will it be different or will it be like right now? How can you be a good open suite map ancestor? Thank you. That's it. Well, maybe, maybe as, as, a, as a last word, <laughs> I, like we don't, we don't want to leave you on a, on, a, on a dark note. That was not the intention of the talk. I, I think in all this, through all, all these experiences, it's also important to, to acknowledge and to recognize that um, contributing to OpenStreetMap is an incredibly joyful experience. And it is because we get to meet people like you and we get to meet each other. I get to be friends with David, who otherwise I would never have met. And, uh, and I, I deeply admire the guy and my life is enriched because of it. Um, and, and maybe uh, um, sometimes that makes you look at the world differently. And I think fundamentally that's, that's what we're talking about. Uh, and sometimes life is hard and sometimes it's joyful and both kind of coexist. Thank you. Thank you. Great, yeah, thank you so much. I think yeah, we could talk or uh, yeah, listen to you talk <laughs> for, for the whole afternoon actually. But yeah, yeah, we you're still around today as well and we got now yeah, around eight eight minutes left for a discussion. Are there any questions? Janet, yeah. 
Hi, uh, thank you very much. That was <clears throat> absolutely brilliant. Um, I wondered, um, I totally agree that we should be um, trying to put marginalised communities and individuals in the centre, and I, but I wondered if you thought that, there, that, that we are s somehow, uh, um, OpenStreetMap is going away from that by the influence of big corporates um, mapping um, activities. Um, and I also thought, do you think um, we, as we have a responsibility not to be working with authoritarian regimes that are actually working against indigenous people, perhaps? I'm thinking particularly in, the, in places like the Philippines. Um, I think, I think the, the question, like when, what I've been learning, for, for me, a, a good illustration of this is the, the Facebook automated imports, where, where I think the fear that I'm hearing that you're articulating is uh, the fear of a, a large, powerful uh, uh, organization that kind of takes over. And, and I think the Facebook uh, journey really uh, illustrates to me how even if it starts out in a way that, it, that is maybe, maybe it's not as it should have started out, in the end, I think the, 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 the circumstances we're finding in ourselves in now, how, how this, these imports are organized now, where uh, in, in fact it's now communities and organizers who are in charge of saying this is where we want the support of the machine. Uh, but fundamentally it's still organized and coordinated by humans. Uh, uh, so I think that's an illustration of, 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 of I think, the best possible outcome. And in, in any one of those circumstances where we initially we might be concerned about a, a, an imbalance of, of capacity or an imbalance of power, I think the real strength of OpenStreetMap as, as an ecosystem is that we, we work through, in part through discourse, that someone proposes something and someone else responds and then we have a dialogue and then out of that uh, ultimately the outcome emerges and I think that's really powerful. Uh, I have a quick answer. The part about authoritarian regimes, I really can't. It really varies. Uh, the part about working with corporates, this is a very personal observation. The people I worked with in the, in the war zone, in the disaster zone, when our contracts ended, they were employed by corporates. That's how they can continue to become OSM volunteers. So they still do the volunteering, organize things. We had an open street map cake during the 15th anniversary last, last time. That was fun. But they have to pay the bills, and they have children, and there was someone to pay them to do OSN. So I don't know if that's a normative statement or not, but that's, that's what's happening, Janet. Thank you for, thank you for what you said. Are there more questions? Yeah, Mohamed? Uh, thanks a lot. Uh, well, uh, you made a very good point that uh, we should pay uh, the contributors. I believe totally that uh, in this world where uh, one of the functional fuel is money, you cannot run an engine that solely works on motivation and recognition. I mean, you need to bring something which is more tangible. So keeping that in mind, how do you see value propagation should take place, uh, which is uh, monopoly independent and which is being uh, driven by the protocol, I don't know, or uh, how that should work, I mean, so that the contributor should make something like which is he wish he can, he or she can touch. I don't know, this is, uh, well, how, do you, how do you perceive this situation? Like, do you have a, a picture in mind in that direction or? So it's, it's, it's the acoustics in this room are quite bad. It was quite, quite hard to understand your question. But so you, you, in part you're asking about the question of labor and, and payment, yes? Yeah, but I'm not talking, I, I don't believe in like wage kind of system, but rather value, right. the value that a contributor has generated, yeah, yeah. value and how it should come back to him okay. that is more tangible. So, so the question in, in part is the question of incentivization, right? What, 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 show, what yes. should we, how should we reward uh, contribution? Tangible reward. You mean like money in simple words? Right. Yeah, and I think it's, 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 it's quite a complicated question. I think, and, and I think so. Th thank you for asking that question because it remains unanswered. Like fundamentally, there is not a straightforward question to answer. Um, you can look at it from the perspective of uh, uh, motivational psychology which was my original research looking at what drives mappers. And, and there we largely find that in volunteering settings, people kind of have their own motivations and they, they get their own enjoyment out of the practice and you don't need to give them candy. 
uh, in order to keep them around. In fact, uh, uh, just make sure that they, there are no barriers to, to participation. And for them, that already has value and, 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 and uh, often has value and has, has, has a kind of reward uh, in itself. And, and when you then start introducing payment, that's actually often discouraging. Like volunteering and payment does not really easily get along, and in fact, often it's 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 it's, it's quite uh, uh, harmful. Yeah, but Sorry. but mass adoption is also uh, one of the requirement. Mass yeah, yeah, adoption. Yeah, yeah. Well, so that was the first part, and the second part is the the reason why this is challenging is this does not apply to all the world's circumstances and all the individual yeah. circumstances. Mm -hmm. And for some people, the question is not how can I volunteer my time. But the question is like, how can I uh, uh, earn, how can I gain market uh, uh, um, uh, uh, employment skills? How can I advance myself personally and professionally? Uh, how can I educate myself in a way that uh, uh, maybe it allows me to build a better future for my family? Um, how can I respond to circumstances in my community that we are affected by? And what, what active steps can I take and all these kind of things? And, and on top of that, how do I pay my rent? Yeah. while doing that. I'd like to add to that kind of a counterpoint to what I said about employment. I also recognize uh, that's the sheer pleasure of making a map is mm. for the craft mappers out here. Mm. That's very important. You're not paid then, you know, you just enjoy it and um, we just have to recognize that, that, too, yeah. that there's inherent value in, in that in itself. You're not thinking of any purpose. I'm just, this is a nice polygon and I close it and I tagged it. It feels great. Mm, as, as basic as that. So I think largely what we're trying, also trying to say is I don't think there is one way of rewarding all OpenStreetMap mappers. I think there are many ways and they're all kind of, they, they also varies by the person. Like pe people, different people might go for different things. Does that answer your question? Thank you. Yeah. I think Frederick was first. Yeah. Hello. Hello. Okay. <laughs> you, you raised a number of, of good points in uh, saying that, yeah, I, I remember one thing that you mentioned there, there might be, for example, holy sites, should we map them, uh, in how far we, do we need to respect local customs and so on. In a larger, <laughs> pulling that up a bit, um, many wars have been fought on the planet about people thinking that they have a good idea that should benefit everyone, like, you know, we have democracy, you also need to have democracy, we'll, we'll send our troops to help you uh, get democracy or something like that. Uh, we have this religion and it's going to benefit everyone. Sometimes I wonder if um, maybe OpenStreetMap is not the right thing for everyone. Maybe this idea, we have OpenStreetMap, it is so great and it's had ha already helped all these people, it's also going to help you. Uh, let's put this marginalized group on the map because we are sure that it'll benefit them. Um, maybe sometimes, I sometimes feel there might be a, a hint of a cultural imperialism, like, you know, this is, we know this is good and it's going to be good for you. Maybe you don't know it yourself, but we are going to help you. I wonder if, and, and, you, and you said things like, uh, let us put marginalized people uh, uh, on, on the boards and, and let us try and shape the organization to uh, fit these people better. But just because there are different kinds of marginalized people don't, doesn't mean they agree. On, on, on the contrary, marginalized people fight each other to the death in many, many areas of the planet. So maybe, maybe it is a bad idea to have one organization, one central organization to run all this, one open street map project. Maybe there should be like smaller federated projects uh, and then people could like design locally how they want their whatever mapping or maybe they don't want any. Um, I don't know, maybe we should go away from this, from this idea of, of having the the hot or the open street map or something and just say, you know, let's, let's try and, and, and kind of federalize that in some way. Yeah, uh, I'd like to uh, thank you. This is one, these are wonderful, wonderful points. On a personal note, I, I kind of find it very uncomfortable, uncomfortable when someone says, hey, you are the map maker, David. I, thought, I am just a map maker. I'm not the map maker. I think there's, there's a connection to that kind of, let's be the hero. Let's, let's, this is good for you. And I, I'm trying to unlearn, unlearn that. That image of the geographer by Johannes Vermeer on the left. I think that's related to that. I, I agree with your point. Uh, what if there's going to be a ministry of mapping led by indigenous peoples and it's not OpenStreetMap? 
OSMF board who governs it. Uh, that's what I said earlier. Maybe it's not, it shouldn't be me who should be making these, these maps. I totally agree, agree with that. On a particular point, uh, a moment when I went to Aotearoa, I went to a conference, a Maori Housing and Urban Development Conference funded by my scholarship. I was so excited. I told the Maori intellectual and an activist, let's, let's do open street map in Aotearoa. It's going to be good for everyone. And Dr. Jenny Lee Morgan said, well, David, talk to the indigenous people first, talk to the iwi, the tribe, because we have data sovereignty. We have indigenous data sovereignty. And on a very fundamental worldview level, it's different from the Western property model. The knowledge is not privatized. It is shared by the group. Some things must remain hidden. And this is for us. Some things we will share, but we have to talk with our elders and the whole clan. And it takes years to talk about that. Because in the previous age, when we were colonized, this is what they say, we lost land because those features were known. So I, I broadly agree with both of the things that you said, and thank you for, mm -hmm. for saying that. That's thank you important. for raising it. I have to close the discussion, unfortunately. Sasha, and I hope, can you grab them in a, in a break? Sorry for this, yeah. It's a really, really amazing discussion. I would like to follow on this, and please also let us know what we can do more from the State of the Map um, side to also make our conference more inclusive. So it would be also interested to get your feedback, but also all, all of our feedback and how we can make this happen. Thank you so much for this. Thank you so much. Thank you.